I uh, uh, wanted to also thank um, my colleagues and collaborators at, at Wow Cornell. We are a collaboration um, uh, between three parts, the Center for Special Studies, which is the HIV clinic. It's in two separate sites, uh, one in Chelsea and, and one located in the hospital, the Division of Infectious Diseases and, and our division in geriatrics. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the age-related concerns that, that we've been uncovering um, and, and some of the challenges that we've had. So uh, our program's young, um, uh, and, and I am uh, uh, Chagrin to say that I really had not given uh, uh, HIV much thought since my internship until a uh, colleague from CSS gave geriatric grand rounds on, on aging and HIV, and, and I woke up very quickly. Um, and we talked a lot about what we could do, and, and we began with some clinical conferences and some ad hoc consults. Uh, but it wasn't until 2015 that we started a formal program with foundation support from uh, Samuels Foundation. And uh, similarly, we've started some focus groups. Um, we, uh, as well, um, uh, provided some education to the staff. Um, and uh, we found that the best solution would be not to take any patients from their providers, but, but to embed geriatricians within, within the clinic. And, and so on Thursday afternoons in one site or the other, a, a geriatrician is there to see consults. And we have been doing this now for about two years. Um, uh, we also have recognized uh, um, that the geriatric care is only a small part of what people need. Um, and uh, we've had um, programs of our own that the, the eight, over 50 support group was already there before we started. Uh, we, we started another one. And we've had several programs. One uh, I've, I've posted there is this Legacy Arts program, which is a collaboration with uh, Elder Share the Arts, a, a um, community organization to um, uh, have a 10-week um, program to, for, for uh, patients to uh, do a group collage. And we did that last year. It was very successful, and we're, we're doing it again this year. So that there, there are a variety of linkages to community-based supports and services. Uh, another example is uh, uh, through our focus groups. Um, uh, there was a great interest in mentoring. Um, uh, and, and we had thought about setting up a buddy system, but realized that it would be much more effective if we, if we linked through GMHC and made our referrals there. So, so similar to what you've heard, some things can be homegrown, some things can be linkages, uh, some things we have to um, uh, collaborate with others and let them do the work, but the, the clear message from our patients was, was uh, this wasn't just putting a, a, a geriatrician in the clinic. Uh, it was uh, a broad range of activities and needs. So I'll talk um, about, uh, I'll f focus mostly on the, 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 the topmost challenges, the patient accrual and, and uh, figuring out um, how we optimize consult value. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about long-term care at the end. So. Um, uh, my goal, and there are two of us who see, see patients at, at CSS, was, was to figure out how I'm going to uh, do a geriatric assessment in an hour. And, and uh, that involves not just the standard assessment tools or abbreviated standard assessment tools, but, but also a history and, and a physical and, and just an opportunity to talk. Because what we have recognized is that that first visit is, is comprehensive in its way, but it's not uh, longitudinal. And, and we begin to develop a relationship after patients come back. Um, uh, Two other points. One is that we had the uh, option of um, uh, embedding the assessment tools within EPIC so that I can uh, now just click on uh, uh, the answers and it will be printed in my final note. And it's also collected as, as scales, so, so uh, the, there is an opportunity to see longitudinally if, I, if I've seen someone uh, in, in two visits a year apart to see, to see both assessments. Um, and um, the second is that in talking with people, it became clear to me that one of the most interesting things was, was just 
figuring out what was important to them, what, what their goals were. And so I formalized that, and, and after about 10 patients or so, I began to ask very specifically of each one, what, what are your goals? And, and have found that to be um, very, very insightful and, and, and an opportunity to really begin to understand what people need and what they're worried about. So um, th this number is a little bigger than, than what Chrissy pre presented. That's because I I'm, uh, don't have to worry about a six-month follow-up. I'm, I'm showing you more recent data. Uh, but the numbers are, are very, very similar. Our median age was 67 um, and 69% and, uh, uh, men, um, uh, about half MSM. Um, uh, the, the, the uh, table on the right, um, again, gives you an idea of, of the percentage frailty, about 16% are smoking. Uh, most are ADL independent, um, about a third have some IADL problem. Um, uh, about a, a third um, screen in in the PHQ-4 for anxiety and, and, and about a quarter for depression. That doesn't mean that, that only a quarter are depressed. It just means that, that even uh, with our four on-site psychiatrists, this group uh, still is having uh, symptoms of depression. 60% live alone, half complained of fatigue, uh, almost two-thirds complained of poor memory, and I, I included uh, how many, what percentage, fewer than a third, are getting bone densities, um, uh, because that, that's turned out to be a, a, um, an example of some of the, the challenges I have in, in uh, uh, convincing people to um, look at their patients as aging and, and, and prepare. Now, um, this next is, uh, uh, graph is, is, is what we talk about, not necessarily what the, the primary or only problem is, but what it ends up we spend most of our time on. And, and so, um, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, of the 75 patients, 45 um, cognition is, is, the, is the commonest thing we talk about. We talk a lot about community services. Uh, uh, usually there's some medical problem we discuss. Um, and, and you can uh, see um, down the line that, that uh, there's a variety of problems. Sometimes it's goals of care, sometimes it's uh, pain or incontinence, um, occasionally it's smoking cessation and there, there are a smattering of others uh, in, in the, the box to the right. But um, the, the, this is sobering to me. This has been kind of a QA process to me to collect these data because um, the, the, the prevalence of polypharmacy is not 15%. The prevalence of polypharmacy is about 100%. And so one of the things I have to ask myself when pain or polypharmacy are, are not major topics of discussion, is that because I don't know what to do? Is it because uh, there's so many other things to talk about, I can't cover it? I don't know the answer, but I, 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 I find it interesting to challenge myself to determine why there might be a discrepancy between uh, the prevalence of the problem and the frequency with which it is discussed. Now, this is of 63 patients, but these are the, the goals the patients talk to me about uh, when I, again, I directly ask them, what are your goals? And not, not, of, the, not of the appointment, but just goals in life. Um, the commonest ones have to do with finances, but I draw your attention to the, to the left uh, most column, which is that a significant number of people are unable to articulate any goal. They just say, I have none. Um, uh, uh, many are focused on, again, staying alive, and, and some of the ones that, that we would hope they would have, something uh, related to relationships or dreams or travel, those are far um, less frequent. And, and it, it is a reminder to me to begin again to focus on, on what the patient's most fundamental needs are, because that's what they're focused on. Uh, these are some other data that um, they, 44% rate their health as fair or poor, and almost half rated pain is at least moderate. So again, there, there, there are many, many things that are on their minds. There are limited number of uh, opportunities for me to deal with that on that first visit. Now, uh, I wanted to talk a little about the MOCA because I, I think that's our, our stock and trade, but it's, it's a very, very challenging tool to use. Um, so the, the first point I'll bring up is that I asked them, how's your memory? 
and you know, are you having any problems with your memory? And I, I also do a MOCA, and, and there doesn't appear to be much correlation between the MOCA score and the complaints about memory, which, and I see some nods of heads, it's, uh, that shouldn't be too surprising. And I, I also chose a, a threshold of 24 rather than 26, because if our threshold was 26, uh, um, probably two thirds to three quarters would, would um, screen in. So I'm not quite sure what our sensitivity and specificity should be for a MOCA. The other point I'll bring up is that, is that again, I come to this as a, a, a geriatrician um, who um, has been doing primary care for uh, a number of years in, uh, for very old people. And uh, what I am used to and, and what, is the norms, the, what are the norms for me uh, may not be the norms for this population. And, and, and one of the, uh, if you have not done a MOCA, one of the, the um, things that we ask the patients to do is within a minute, name as many words as you can that begin with the letter F. And um, uh, in, in an HIV clinic, um, the F-bomb is dropped far more than I have ever seen it dropped anywhere. And, and I've asked myself, okay, um, uh, once I got over the shock, because if, if, it's a, if, if this were to happen in my other clinic, it would be frontotemporal dementia without, without any questions asked. <laughs> What's happening here? Is this... Is this um, a sign of a cognitive impairment that's manifesting in a different way? Is this culturally very different? Am I seeing culture? Am I seeing, am I seeing a cohort effect? Is everybody of this age going to be doing this in, in a few years? And I don't know the answer, but one of the challenges I have is taking those tests and those things I thought I knew how to do and interpreting them for a very new population that I am not familiar with and trying to decide uh, what is, and what, what is new and what is not, what is normal and what is not, what merits attention and what, what is, is something that requires that I um, get my act together and understand that this is not abnormal at all. And I think that we have to reevaluate uh, not just the tools and choose our tools wisely, but, but, but use them uh, intelligently. And, and that's, that's one of my challenges, figuring out how am I going to use these data um, so what's working? And, and, and I think that um, uh, embedding a geriatrician in the clinic enables creative collaboration. Our clinic is structured that we have a rounds at the end of every afternoon. So every case is discussed that day with all the providers. So I have a chance to um, tell people what, what, what I think is going on and oftentimes get my my misperceptions corrected. Uh, these, are, these are patients who may have fooled me and, and uh, I can get uh, uh, some real-time real feedback from the social worker and the, and the primary care clinician about what, what's been going on. Uh, I can also reshape uh, my uh, recommendations based on what, what's been said. So again, the, the, the outcomes that you heard today were based on notes that were written after these rounds. So the numbers would have been worse if I hadn't, if I hadn't uh, realized, okay, that that recommendation is not going to work because I just heard what's going on with this patient and I, I need to be more cognizant of, of the background. The second is that, you know, geriatricians write PT recommendations and people are often willing, to, are almost always willing to, to uh, uh, enact them, but that's the opening. That's the opening. That's what they expect us to do. And, and the comprehensive assessment allows us to, to um, bring the patient back, to follow the patient, to figure out if physical therapy worked. The MOCA has been valuable. It, 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 it's an, a wonderful opportunity to go back to rounds and say, you know, this is the way they did the MOCA. They were, they were, it was odd. They, they were able to do this, but they weren't able to do that. And we need to think about what, what that means. Um, and that social workers, again, are interested in the aging services network. Our social worker has uh, assisted them. Uh, but um, I've also, um, uh, found that, that a casual mention during rounds of, of, of some referral um, is immediately absorbed by social workers and, and they uh, incorporate it in, in what, um, what they offer to our patients. Now, you know, what, what it, it, it isn't, hasn't all been perfect and, and um, it, in our case it is not an automatic opt-out referral. I have to advertise, I have to keep reminding people that I'm happy to see patients. Um, there's a general reluctance, I think, to 
um, refer just on the basis of age. They have to have a reason. Um, and and uh, I have to give them more reasons for that. You know, there, there are plenty of, of referrals based on memory problems or on gait problems, but, but um, uh, we have to go beyond that. Um, and then there are patients who don't want to see um, a geriatrician, and even when we uh, reframe who I am, which is the aging specialist, they don't want to see the aging specialist either, and, and, and that's, a, that's a problem as well if, you are, if you're basing your referrals on uh, a completely voluntary system. So it, it, what relationship should we have with people who are aging with HIV, and, and uh, in this case, we in geriatrics run a program that's embedded within CSS, but who should run the program? Um, and is there a subgroup whose primary care we as geriatricians should provide? And I, I, I think in, in, the answer is going to be yes to that. Um, uh, should we be more active in the provision of care? And again, I have no HIV experience, uh, and, and, and therefore I will not write an order, for any kind of order, without checking with the clinician first. I just won't do it, and, and, and that's the only safe way. How are we going to co-manage, and, and uh, uh, how, um, as patients' primary care becomes more and more complicated, are we going to share the work? Um, the other point is, what's the value of the longitudinal follow-up? I love following up on patients. I, I develop a stronger relationship with them. I begin to understand more of the um, problems they have or more of the reasons why some of the things I'd like them to do they cannot do. Um, I can detect what, uh, uh, if, if someone's cognitive function is declining. And, and, and the social workers know that I can help them with problems. I, I've told some of you one of my um, uh, the biggest problem, problems right now is helping a social worker deal with a bed bug problem for a, a patient whose cognitive function is declining. And we have met over this several times, and, and that's, that's part of what I want to do. I, I don't want to, to have geriatric assessment to be viewed as a one-time phenomenon. Um, the other, I think, uh, a, a more realistic question for programs that don't have geriatricians is, is how is CGA going to be done? Who's going to do it? Um, uh, is it incorporated into the clinical practice or uh, are there other people who will come in to do it? Who has the time? Um, and and I, I think we have to be really realistic. You know, what, what are, what's the minimum number of questions I can ask to get at the problems that we need to get at? And are there parts of comprehensive geriatric assessment that we can skip? Are there, are there, there, there are data I haven't reported today. Are there, are there things that I don't have to do, that no one has to do, that, 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 that's not going to come up unless something else comes up? Um, and, and how should the information be disseminated and translated into action? I know that the results of the comprehensive assessment are pasted right into my note, but I don't uh, uh, yet have a way of making sure that people understand what it is that, that I want them to see. And, and so figuring out how to highlight the important information in, in ways that duplicate my recommendations is, is, is another challenge that I have. Uh, as, as you heard uh, this morning, you know, our, our, I'm not sure we're helping. And, and uh, what, what is it that I'm doing that's, that's helpful? And, and what is comprehensive geriatric assessment adding? Um, it, my um, other big concern is, is you know, why, why am I not getting through? And bone health is a very good example of, of how um, there are so many fears about bisphosphonates, about, about uh, um, other, uh, other complications that having bone health addressed is, is, um, is, is a problem I have yet to solve. But it's, a, it's an example of how I think the, the literature backs me up, but, um, but I haven't figured out how to uh, convince people to, um, to work with me on that. Now, I, I also I want to end with, with, with saying that I am, I am really, as a geriatrician, just, just one tiny part of all this. And, and, and as I, even in the, the brief period of time, maybe the five years I've even been aware of this field, I've watched it go from, from you know, recognition from demographics to multimorbidity to, to aging-related syndromes. And I think that the 
the uh, uh, care paradigm or the, the, the things we need to focus on are also evolving in that, in that right now we're struggling with how to manage these folks in the office, but the real threat, the real thing that we have to start working on now is long-term care. Um, and um, I, I really think that the future of, of geriatric HIV care is outside the office. It's not inside the office. And how, how are we going to meet the psychosocial and long-term care needs? And how are these programs going to be paid for? I have a, a approached um, special needs programs to figure out, you know, are there ways that we could create some sort of uh, accountable care system that where, where geriatrics can be built in? Um, uh, one of the, the things we've talked about is, is how um, going from Medicaid to Medicare may result in loss of support because the, the whole wraparound program of, an, of a completely Medicaid-based um, special needs program will give way to a, a, a fee-for-service Medicaid and Medicare. And, and, and um, care coordination is, is at risk of, for falling apart. How do we prepare patients for that? How do we ensure that care coordination continues? Um, I, I've tried approaching housing organizations. There are so many wonderful geriatric models, villages and norks and all sorts of things that we could talk about at some other point that have tremendous value and, and validity for this population but, but have to be reshaped so that they meet their needs. Um, uh, philanthropies, uh, and, and again, are going to be required to help these programs continue. Um, and and um, uh, how, how, again, this, we can get the city or other, uh, uh, other places that may have a little more money than we do to support us are, are all challenges we have. So I will end there with, with um, uh, Saturn and, and another great bit of, of collaborative international science. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.